Thank you so much, Peter, to, for the introduction. This is a uh, joint work with uh, Ron Canil, who is also in the audience. And in this paper, we are interested in understanding this uh, pervasive uh, feature of professional services industries where clients, and let me give you kind of in the context of mutual funds an example of, say, investors, um, allocating capital to a fund family and paying fees to the fund family, we, call, we refer to this as the intermediary, who then hires a money manager, we refer to that as an agent, to manage and oversee that investor capital and making clients, the investors, uh, be the residual claimants of the ser quality of services, i.e. returns in the setting, of the money manager. Now, the intermediary has a lot of discretion in how it manages the agent. In particular, it uh, chooses who to hire, how, how much to pay them, et, et cetera. And this is why we refer to compensation part as in red, meaning that it is re very rarely observable. Now, as we started working with this, thinking about it, this setting from a fund family perspective, we noticed that it's quite pervasive in a large number of firms, but mostly professional firms. And so investment banks, uh, law firms, consulting firms, accounting firms, all have this feature where the clients care a lot about the agent's underlying ability to provide high quality services to them. But at the same time, they can only indirectly kind of uh, affect things because ultimately it's the intermediary who makes these uh, hiring decisions. In this setting, we want to understand what drives the intermediary's profitability, but on top of that, of course, how it influences the agent's uh, career, compensation, and the quality of services provided to clients. In the, all of these settings that we kind of thought about and tried to kind of out, outline the scope of the paper, uh, we understand that ability is important, but also that agents agents, money managers, bankers, they generate performance. They generate certain products, quality of services, they returns, and everyone can observe them, can learn, and this public quality of past services offers the agent a reputation to kind of uh, a way to build and establish himself in the industry. However, due to, by nature of the fact that the intermediary has a closer working relationship with the agent and takes a more active role in hiring uh, and retaining them, they tend to more, uh, know more about the agent than clients, and this is kind of the angle through which we're going, lens through which we're going to view this. Now, the, as I mentioned before, there is limited transparency, and then the intermediary sets compensation for the agent privately, and this is going to matter. This, is kind of, this assumption is, of course, driven by the institutional settings. Now, the intermediary's profits are basically going to be the difference between the revenues from the clients and the compensation paid to the agent. And the revenue-maximizing intermediary wants to maximize this difference. But what prevents uh, compensation from dropping like a stone is the fact that the agent does have outside options in the market. One of them, an important one, is that the agent can try to uh, approach clients on contract and provide these services to them directly. In the context of a mutual fund, the uh, mutual fund manager can leave and try to raise capital to start his own hedge fund. In the context of investment banking or legal practices, they can go and work for past clients as in-house counsel. And so this is very, uh, kind of a, a very pervasive feature also of professional firms. Now, this direct outside option of the agent is going to be fully endogenous in our model is going to discipline the intermediary. However, we also consider the kind of the lateral possibility of lateral moves across intermediaries for the agent. However, the economics do not change because this outside option that I've outlined to you is this relevant bargaining point which, uh, ca which captures basically uh, the features of the agent's career and the dynamics of, its comp of uh, their compensation. So this paper, uh, our results kind of in addition to just understanding that, understanding better what drives intermediaries profitability also allow us to characterize uh, the agent's career in, um, as a two kind of uh, two phase, um, uh, in two phases. One is when there's a lot of asymmetric information about the ability of the agent. What this means is that if that agent was trying to approach the client, uh, clients directly, he would suffer a lot of adverse selection, which makes this, option, this outside option fairly unprofitable, allowing the intermediary to extract a lot of rents and effectively expropriate the agent. 
However, due to the fact that the agent, while working for the intermediary, generates performance that eventually reveals, that gradually reveals his ability, what happens is that that informational advantage initially held by the intermediary gets reduced. Once it's compressed enough, the intermediary can no longer profitably expropriate the agent because the agent has already built a sufficient reputation with clients almost independently. And in this case, the intermediary is going to start speeding up, surprisingly, information revelation by churning lower skilled agents. This churning of lower skilled agent is a credible market signal of the agent's ability to the clients in the long run. And a long-lived agent, especially high skilled ones that are retained by the intermediary through this churning period, are going to find it so valuable that they're willing to undergo part of their reservation wage. So they're willing to kind of give up much of their wage in order to survive for a bit longer during the churn, during the churn cycle. And this, even though this in re this churning reduces the asymmetric information and intermediary advantage even further. It actually increases the um, flow of profits because of the agent being willing to pay for reputation. Now, this paper relates to a large literature, both in economics and finance. Uh, in particular, compensation without commitment and uh, career concerns literature. We have a long-lived agent who cares about their uh, long-run uh, perspectives in the industry. We also relate closely to labor markets with asymmetric information frictions with the closest paper to ours being Bruce Greenwald's 1986 Restud paper, which basically introduced adverse selection as an important labor market friction, and we're kind of revisiting uh, some of those economic forces. What helps us gain a lot of traction in the analysis I'm about to show you is the recent work on dynamic adverse selection, uh, which um, kind of some of you in, in the audience, including our discussant, has contributed to. So this is a theoretical model, and let me go over the setup. The intermediary, think about this, a good example of this would be a, a fund family offering a mutual fund to, to investors. And it offers basically a service in the form of a mutual fund. To operate the service, the intermediary needs an agent to run it at any given point in time, but because the service kind of can outlast the agent, the intermediary can replace the, can replace the agent. Now, for now, just kind of to understand the model, let's not think about the replacement, let's just think about the first agent working for the, uh, for the intermediary. Now, the intermediary is going to know more about the agent's ability than clients, more on this on next slide. The intermediary can use this information to set contingent wages, and that what allows them to do this is the institutional feature that compensation is private, private and not observed by clients. So it allows for a degree of discrimination across agents of different abilities. The agent lets the, uh, the intermediary lets the agent go at an observable time tau, which basically is the length of employment of the employment spell with a particular firm, and that one would argue is readily observable. And it costs, uh, it, there's a fixed cost of hiring a new agent. The agent has basically three options in this world. One, work for the intermediary. Two, open his own firm, i.e. contract directly with clients. Or three, leave the industry altogether. We can allow, as I mentioned, for more intermediaries, but this is going to be basically an extension that I'll briefly mention towards the end. Now, the agent's ability, which is the kind of the whole point of, uh, uh, point of the paper, is latent. We assume it's binary in this kind of simpler version of the uh, version of the model, and it captures the latent quality of the services. And everything kind of uh, rests on everyone trying to figure out what this ability is, i.e., who are the good managers, who are the bad managers. Now, for contrast, opening the firm is going to be costless, so switching from an intermediary to own firm, there's not going to be any deadweight cost, no compliance cost. We can introduce them, it changes nothing, uh, at least in our paper. Now, we're also going to normalize the outside option of, uh, of the agent from leaving the industry altogether to a constant, which basically indicates that the agent's ability does not matter once he's out of the industry. Now, the clients, we're, in order to kind of capture the range of professional services examples that I've mentioned before, we're going to model the client's demand for services in reduced form as an increasing demand function of the agent's perceived ability. This can be both on the willingness to pay margin or on the quantity of services provided by the agent. So the firm's revenue function is going to be A of the client's belief about the agent's ability. So, when it comes to private information, we think that when the, we're going to model it as when the agent is hired. So at the start of each agent's employment smell, the intermediary and the agent are going to observe a common private signal about theta. It's going to be imperfect. We're going to assume it's continuously distributed uh, so that the model is um, kind of offers an elegant, um, elegant solution. And uh, this continuous distribution 
distribution of private beliefs is effectively going to be the private type of the agent as far as everyone is concerned. In addition to this private signal that the intermediary and the agent observe, there's also publicly observable performance signals which in a kind of the main in the main part of the paper, we're going to, we is going to follow a Poisson process in the sense that good agents are going to generate good performance, bad agents are going to generate good performance until there is a shock to their, uh, and there, unless there is a Poisson shock, which perfectly reveals good agents from bad. Now I understand that, well, it reveals that the agent is bad. Uh, now, I understand that this is a very stylized specification. We've done a lot of work in extending it to a much richer Brownian environment, which I don't think I'll have time to go into in detail today. But most of the results kind of obtained in this parsimonious structure r remain in a much richer setting. Now, neither the intermediary nor the agent observe theta privately, so they have to kind of, they have to use their private information at time zero in conjunction with the public news or public performance to figure out, you know, an agent who performed well <coughs> What is his ability? And basically, with this negative Poisson uh, learning, what happens is that the agent performs well, beliefs, uh, mar beliefs are marginally revised upward. Once the agent generates a Poisson shock, beliefs drop like a stone to zero. And because performance is publicly observable, that uh, drop to basically zero, the agent is revealed to be unskilled, applies to both intermediary agent and even clients. Now, the clients observe the performance signals, but they don't observe private information PT, and they're trying to infer it. Now, the way they do this, because, is, because the agent's employment spell with the intermediary's public knowledge, they try to figure out basically who is leaving the intermediary web, how to infer the length of the career spell, conditional on, say, the path of good performance, since bad performance perfectly reveals the agent anyways. So we're going to introduce some notation here in order to kind of define an equilibrium and work through it. And we're going to define by KT as the belief about the agent who's op who opens his verb at time T from the perspective of clients. Again, clients don't observe the actual kind of the private information of the agent and they're trying to basically figure, out, figure this out and this is going to, we're going to denote their inference as KT. Now, in the equilibrium I'm going to talk about uh, right now, we're going to focus on a cutoff equilibrium where KT is basically the worst remaining agent working for the intermediary. Where this is um, almost without loss, as we've kind of, uh, as I'm going to mention towards the end. So we can kind of extend this to um, extend this to either greater scope of monotonicity or things like divinity and stability as well. So once the agent opens his own firm. Once he leaves and being perceived as KT, we also assume that the, agent, the clients can only learn from performance, meaning that there is no additional ways that the agent can credibly signal his ability. This is also, with, uh, this is also to some extent without loss of generality in that we've performed a lot of analysis to understand if there are other forms of signaling that are available to the agent, whether that uh, changes things, and basically it's a horse race between two signaling mechanisms, but as long as performance is sufficiently informative, this is, um, this is an innocuous assumption. Now with this in mind, if the agent leaves and is perceived by K, uh, as type KT, he's looking at the expected long-term value of, his, uh, of him staying in the industry, which is just the expected discounted value of revenues collected from clients. These revenues are increasing if the agent generates good performance, if the agent generates bad performance even when running his own firm. Uh, clients perceive him as unskilled and the agent optimally leaves the, in leaves the industry. Now, interestingly, the agent's outside option of contracting directly with clients depends both on their reference, but also on his ability. Because if he thinks he's very capable, then it's very likely that they're going to stay in the industry for a long time. So this the, refers to the agent's outside option. Uh, and now we're going to introduce a second, ver a second uh, belief variable for the clients that simply refers to the agents who are staying with the intermediary. So if the agent is staying with the intermediary, then the clients assign to him a belief of QT. And under this cutoff structure that I've mentioned earlier, these are basically the agents that are better than the, K, than the type KT. So the way you should think about our equilibrium construction as I'm going to walk through it is that it's the bad agents who are more likely to leave. It's the, relative, it's the better agents who are staying at every point in time. And this wedge between QT, i.e. the average agent who stays, and the cutoff agent KT, that's the adverse selection penalty that the agent would suffer were he to, leave, were he to try to contract directly with clients. Now, Sorry, this is a bit, uh, there you go. Uh, 
so the equilibrium here is going to be a collection of a stopping time and a type-specific wage process chosen by the intermediary, such that given the client's beliefs KT and QT, uh, KT and QT the length of time for which it's optimal to employ the agent and the wages paid uh, maximize the intermediary's revenue, uh, expected revenues, profits, which is the difference between revenues and wages paid, plus the continuation value of basically hiring a new agent from the pool and offering this product with a new, ag with a new agent. I'm going to mention V in a sec. However, the disciplining effect of the agent's outside option is that it is, should be incentive compatible for the agent to collect the wages up until the time when he leaves the intermediary rather than leaving the intermediary immediately. It's a very simple individual rationality constraint that's going to be just simply dynamic in equilibrium and depend on uh, performance and things like that. Finally, we're going to focus on stationary equilibrium in which the intermediary's expected value V, so basically intermediary's enterprise value, if you will, is the expected discounted value of employing the stream of, the stream of agents given that uh, these um, stopping time town wage processes W characterize each agent's career. Finally, as I mentioned before, the beliefs, um, we're going to focus on monotone equilibrium where it's the worst agent that leaves. This is largely for the sake of the presentation. And we're looking at perfect Bayesian equilibria, so beliefs KT and QT should be also consistent on path. Uh, so the equilibrium can be characterized in these two phases, the high asymmetric information where there is a lot of uncertainty about the agent's ability and the low asymmetric information case. This is the first one. So suppose that initially that when the agent is hired, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about who this, who this agent is, in which case it's likely that the difference between the average type and the, tail of the and the tail of the distribution is high. Now, once we map this to revenues, this corresponds to the difference between A of QT and A of KT. Now, from an intermediary's perspective, they, they're thinking the following that suppose that I can match the agent's outside option in that instance, meaning that I can pay the agent what he would have gotten anyways were he to approach the clients directly, and I would pay him A of KT. In this case, if I pay this reservation wage to the agent and my profits still exceed my opportunity cost of hiring a new agent, in this case, it, I might as well retain all of them. So in this case, the intermediary optimally retains all the agents regardless of ability. There is no private belief, uh, private belief about ability in this expression. And so this is basically this high symmetric information case where the intermediary hires all agents as long as they perform well. In this case, the beliefs about the cutoff agents simply follow Bayes' rule based on Poisson learning. Now, as performance gradually reveals the agent's skill and ability, the, the asymmetric information gets compressed. If the agent has generated good performance for a long time, we're kind of confident that even the cutoff agent is pretty good. So this brings us to the uh, this brings us to the low asymmetric information region in which the profits, if, were the, inter, if the intermediary were to uh, kind of match the agent's reservation value, falls below the opportunity cost. In this case, it's optimal to start, start letting go of some agents and in equilibrium what happens is the intermediary starts churning the agents from the bottom and gradually. What this generates is basically in each instance that the agent is retained, the beliefs about the cutoff agent marginally increases. So from the perspective of, cli of clients, basically each instance that the agent is hired, were he to leave tomorrow, he's going to be a bit better. It serves as a reputation building device. This leads, interestingly, to the fact that the agent is a long-lived agent is willing to accept a below the reservation wage pay because he's going to subtract from his reservation wage how much he gains from staying with the intermediary through reputation, which is quantity of reputation gain multiplied by the marginal value of reputation for this agent. Now, in this situation, because this uh, higher skilled agents value reputation more than lower skilled agents, they're willing to sacrifice more pay, which makes surprisingly low skilled agents more expensive from the perspective of the intermediary. And that allows us to pin down, uh, pin down in a very parsimonious way this rate of reputation building and rate of churning gamma through the intermediary's cost of employing the worst, the worst remaining agent divided by the marginal value of reputation for this agent. Now, if T star referred to, basic, to the first time when the intermediary became, uh, when it was unprofitable to retain all agents, then past T, so here we do not churn, so we keep all agents as long as they perform well. 
However, past T star, the intermediary in order to maintain profitability has to start churning and at an increasing rate because churning reduces the informational asymmetry. Now, this can also manifest itself in the dynamics for the cutoff type as this, dotted, as this um, dashed line basically starts increasing faster than the dotted line as if there was no churning. And that's the valuable for the agents. So to illustrate the equilibrium dynamics and profitability, so here again on the x-axis is time. T star is the first time when the agent is, unpro is unprofitable. Uh, and the intermediaries, uh, Profits here, net profits, are this blue area over here. And we see here that we start kind of with a high profit margin, but as we learn about the agent's ability, that, that shrinks the intermediary's uh, profits up until they are, the intermediary was about to break even and wants to let go of the worst remaining agent. Now, even though the intermediary lets go of the worst remaining agent, what... Uh, the intermediate agent is going to stay for a little bit longer, going to survive through the, through the per a period of churning, and in the middle of it, pave the intermediary for reputation, which, as you can see, has a non-monotone effect on the intermediary's profits. Now, as there are more than one agent, the equilibrium is, looks a bit more gradual in that, oh, in that as we go, as we scroll through the agents, apologize, this must be a preview app. Uh, so as we scroll through the agents, what happens is that uh, we kind of gradu gradually screen through, through the types up until the highest agent becomes unprofitable. I'm sorry for the graphics. This uh, is sometimes Max do that. Uh, next slide. So we've uh, extended this analysis to a number of um, to a number of extensions, including. Uh, Apologies. This is... There you go. So as I mentioned before, we extended this analysis to, for example, signaling, where the, if the agent were to leave a little bit early, he can still credibly convey his type through a discount. The pay for reputation dyna uh, dynamics hold. We've also kind of extended this logic to more uh, kind of more general, more general forms of signaling, but it's not in the paper yet. Now. One e interesting economic feature of this reputation building, which I find particularly interesting, is that reputation is basically a quality of a worker that allows them to, get re to collect revenues from, uh, cli from clients. And in the sense, it can be viewed as a form of general human capital. We can contrast this with, so be, in other words, working for the intermediary allows the um, agent to build reputation, and there are these pay for reputation dynamics in place. We can contrast this to the pay for training dynamics that have ex been explored in prior literature, where the intermediary is willing to pay to the um, willing to the agent is willing to pay to the intermediary for being trained. Now these are completely different economically, in the sense that as prior literature has noted, training uh, training by an intermediary occurs when there is a lot of asymmetric information, meaning that the agent will stay for the, with the intermediary for a long time. Reputation building conversely occurs when there is not much asymmetric information and we're kind of going through the churn cycle. And as such, these are two different ways in which the intermediary can contribute to the development of the agent. Uh, we've also, we've also con uh, considered things like firm-specific skill, which is particularly relevant for some of the applications where if an agent works for an intermediary, they accumulate intermediary-specific skill, for example, being, being uh, kind of a highly public mutual fund manager working for a fund family. Interestingly enough, because high-skilled agents work, are employed longer by the intermediary, they end up accumulating more specific skill as a byproduct, and that can allow them to escape the churn cycle once it's started. So this means that they can basically serve as beacon, uh, beacon employees, almost, and be retained despite the fact that they, there's not much asymmetric information just by virtue of kind of this firm-specific component. This naturally leads us to think about kind of ways in which our framework uh, talks about promotions. In particular, if an agent survives a churning period, as an example I've just illustrated, there is going to be a pay jump associated with it. So if we think about basically an agent, uh, be, uh, if other agents are churned but this agent kind of the churning has stopped, and then there's going to be a pay jump, which resembles promotions. However, this is not the only way to think about promotions in the setting, because it, we can also introduce costly and completely unproductive promotions that can surprisingly increase intermediaries' value because the, there's more of this pay-for-reputation dynamics going on. 
However, there must be this high, high, relatively high asymmetric information period following a promotion, which uh, a promotion meaning that you don't want to start churning the agents that you've just promoted. Finally, as I mentioned before, our equilibrium survives things like divin uh, divinity. However, the intermediary may be a little bit more selective at the outset. As I mentioned before, also we can talk, think about competition for agents across intermediaries, and that just gives the intermediary more bargaining power. Uh, in terms of expropriation versus pay for reputation, the, the intermediary's equilibrium value is determined by, uh, solves kind of this fixed point where it's the profits from the current agent plus the value of resampling minus the cost. And it is increasing in the, degree, in the asymmetric information about the agent at the outset. So it's not about profit uh, higher skilled agents in expectation for the intermediary, it's about how informed the intermediary is about these agents. As, uh, interestingly, as a function, uh, as a percent of profits resulting from the pay for reputation, this is maximized for intermediate values because in the corners we end up being in a quiet period for too long. Now these comparative statics would look very different if we were just to take V as exogenous. And uh, this is why we think it's important to, to, we, important to look at it as an endogenous object. We've also considered quite carefully a a much richer version of the model that kind of talks about continuous distribution of types and a richer a learning environment because as nice and kind of tractable as a Poisson model is, at the end of the day it's both stylized and bundles the effects of performance and tenure. And the Brownian setting allows us to, allows us to nicely de disentangle it, meaning that at any given point in time there is a cross section of uh, performance signals that uh, the agent uh, can obtain. Uh, our key pay for reputation dynamics hold, but there's an, a number of very interesting insights that occurs as well. In particular, there could be more multiple churning regions. So an agent can basically perform really well and escape a churning region, which seems intuitive. Uh, however, the profit wedge in general, so higher skilled agents both earn more, but are more profitable for the intermediary as well because high, good performance actually expends the informational advantage of the intermediary endogenously through bias learning. And agents who survive a crisis, basically, who perform their way out of a churning period, end up being compensated more going forward. So we view, out, we view this paper as a theory of employment contracts under dynamics adverse selection and without commitment. And it's, we think it's applicable to professions where talent is important and performance is observable and clearly attributable to the agent. And the agent has this opportunity to contract directly with clients in some way. Now, the structure of the agent's career can be decomposed into two phases. One is the high asymmetric information phase where the intermediary tries to keep all the agents by expro expropriating them, but only letting them go if they perform poorly. And the low asymmetric information case where the intermediary surprisingly speeds up information revelation, which in turn increases the profitability of the agents who remain. So being selective in the sense is valuable for the intermediary. This is what I have for you today. Sorry, some of the graphics didn't quite work, but thank you.